I will present this paper as a baseline for the Shenzhen uh, uh, paper, uh, which is called Semi-Supervised Classification with Graph Convolutional Network, which is the GCN uh, model that he just mentioned uh, as a baseline in the, uh, the experiment of the graph attention uh, paper. Okay. So we will not spend too much time for the motivation. So as mentioned earlier, we have a graph probably with some features, example document images, and we seek to perform some kind of tasks based on this graph information like node classification, link prediction, etc. And the point is to use both the graph structure and the feature associated with each node. So that's the objective. So just uh, for the notation, the numbers will be used for nodes, uh, x1, x2 will be used as the node features, like images or documents, and then what we seek to learn is some kind of node representations, which we call here Z, uh, to be used for uh, some of the tasks that I just mentioned. Okay, so how does it work? So suppose that we seek to learn some representation for this node, so what do we do is first we will project all its neighbors into uh, some other representation, the orange one over here. So what do we do here? Since A has two neighbors, uh, two and three, so we have to project two and three first, and then we include X as well. So basically we just add the self loop here. We project itself as well to make sure that uh, the nodes features also contribute to its own representation. Uh, so then, once we have this representation, the next step is to combine them. So the matrix W here is shared across all nodes. So each time you have to project the node. Now once we have combined uh, these uh, new representations, we will pass them through some nonlinearity, example like uh, Leaky Relu or some sigmoid function to get the final representation for A. So that's the whole idea of this uh, graph uh, convolution thing. Okay, so in matrix notation, we have X, which is the feature matrix, which contains as row the nodes, and then as columns the features. We multiply it by some matrix W to get our uh, projected, uh, our first projected matrix uh, in orange here, noted T. Now, the next step is to make use of the adjacency matrix to uh, perform the sum operation. Like the idea is that for each, uh, for each node, you will take into account uh, his first order neighbors. The final one is to pass the matrix, the orange matrix here, over the nonlinearity to get the matrix of node representations. So this is one layer of the graph convolutional uh, network. Okay, so the main difference with an MLP is the introduction of the adjacency matrix here. So usually when you work with MLP you use directly the features, for example a document or an images. Now here in addition to these features you would like to make use of the graph structure. So the way you take into account this graph structure can be reflected by matrix multiplication. This is the operation. So the intuition is to somehow embed the graph structure into the MLP architecture to learn representations. So at the end, what you need to do is that on the top of your representation, you may add some objective to be able to learn uh, the model's parameters in some supervised or semi-supervised way. Here, for example, for uh, uh, the, 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 the multi-label classification problem, you can use the cross-entropy where you have uh, here the representation which correspond uh, to some kind of uh, softmax output, and then you have the true labels, then you just try to minimize this uh, cross entropy to, to learn your uh, neural net parameters W. Okay, uh, so, okay, so the main difference with the work that uh, Chensa presented is that the nodes have equal contribution to the final representation. In the work he presented, the author further propose to use some attention mechanism to give uh, different uh, importance to different uh, neighbors. Uh, so that's the main difference. Okay. So now the question, so the first question is why is it intuitive to make parallels with uh, machine translation? Like in the paper, the authors uh, used a lot of comparison or a lot of reference to translation 
where maybe this kind of attention mechanism were very successful. So why do you think that making such parallel uh, with uh, tasks like classification, for example, in this paper is relevant? Or why is that the fact that the attention mechanism was successful in this kind of task can be useful uh, for uh, other tasks like classifications? Now the second question is how does the multi-head attention helps to stabilize learning? So basically they say we introduce this attention, uh, multi-head attention mechanism to uh, make learning more stable. Uh, I, I couldn't get a sense of why this can help to stabilize learning. Maybe you can help me to understand why and what's the intuition behind this uh, multi-head attention. And then in their experiment, they basically took the results of the other paper directly. So my question is, are the settings exactly the same? To the extent that I have checked, the most of them are pretty much the same. But for example, this paper uses batch learning, whereas they use a stochastic optimization. So I guess this may lead to uh, some differences, and it's hard to make a conclusion uh, based uh, it's hard to make conclusion uh, regarding the performance as we are not running exactly under the same settings. And then the final one, why does the PubMed dataset require different treatment? Like they have, uh, they said like they use different architecture for this data, they use different learning rate. So is there something there? Is it the size of the data or why is that we cannot just reuse the same uh, model as for the other data sets? Yeah. Thank you. For others, there's some time. There's some time. Support. How many times they do the convolution? Oh, uh, the convolution. I think they they've used it. Uh, they've used two layers in their experiment, but then they provide an additional experiment with ten layers. Huh? Two or three, the best setting. Yeah, I think two, seven. for the experiment, two. two. Seven, I think almost seven, no? Okay, okay. So how does the graph density matter? Uh, the graph density matter. Uh, you mean in terms of the number, uh, the average number of neighbors per? Because you would imagine if the graph is dense enough, mm -hmm. then the representation, everything will be the same. Because I take all the neighbors and my neighbors all overlapping with my papers. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I guess so. So in the paper, they don't use directly uh, the agency metrics here. They use uh, some kind of uh, approximated spectral decomposition of this matrix, but I guess you will have the same problem if the matrix is dense. I'm not sure either even the spectral decomposition will contain some useful information. So yeah, I agree. If like the graph structure I mean, it's not expressive enough. This kind of framework is definitely problematic, yeah. Because like everyone will be averaged to almost the same representation. Yeah. So let me just uh, one question. Yeah. Uh, is there any reason for the intuition why we include uh, one of all features to learn the written records. Say, say, say again? Uh, so both GCN and uh, the paper that uh -huh. presented them, uh -huh. they also take into account your uh, own feature vectors. Yes. Of the node. Yeah. So the target node is not one, right? Yeah. You also take into account the yeah. feature of not one. Exactly. Uh, is there any? Yeah, because if you don't take it into account, you don't make use of its feature. Yeah. Right? Yeah. It's kind of weird to use. The other one is that the neighbors in the graph are not always uh, similar in terms of feature. You have, like, you may have two related nodes that are not uh, close in terms of feature representations. So, for example, you. Huh? Which one? Which one? The GCN paper. This one? Yeah. The, with no, actually, the input is in the put a full uh, feature metric. And the input is the, for each row is a, a respect to one uh, item or one uh, node, and each uh, column with respect to one features. So 
room X, the X here, you can move to the next one. The, yeah, the yeah. feature metric here, this is the input. But for, they have another one is the ICNC metric is to capture the network. Yeah, but, but if they that one, that one, they don't include the node itself. Oh, they do. They do. They, 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 they add one to the diagonal okay. to make sure they yeah. include it. So, so just to uh, just to answer the Andrew's question, so imagine this node, for example, is uh, represent, for example, is an image of C, the C, and then you have here, for example, a shark, and some other, uh, for example, a boat. Both of them are related to the C. Now, if you don't make use of the nodes feature, you would probably end up with the C represented by the average of uh, a shark and a boat, which is not very. Uh, uh, good if you are trying to do image classifications uh, into difference of uh, uh, categories. Yeah. So the idea is that you make use of the node feature itself, which is the priority, and then if you can make use of further affirmation that comes from the neighbors, then it's kind of a bonus that you may use to uh, uh, perform a classification task, for example, even better. Any other questions? Okay, then we'll let uh, Salsa have his time. So, for the first one, what is, what is Okay, so there are two similarities between the paper I present and the machine translation. So, for the first similarity, the length of uh, the, the number of inputs are different. So we can see for machine translation, different sentence has different lengths, right? Different number of words. And for our model, uh, different node has different number of neighbors. So in terms of these two, maybe this is one uh, similarity between machine translation and our model. Because different, uh, we can construct a similar model for machine translation because there are different uh, inputs for different uh, sentences or different nodes, right? So maybe this is one similarity. So for the second one, so in terms of the machine translation, uh, we also introduce attention mechanism into machine translation because different world has different kind of attention so that we can translate correctly. So in terms of our model, we also introduce attention mechanism because different neighbor has different important importance to the node that we would like to represent, learn representation for, right? So maybe this is the second similarity, okay? <laughs> So for the second one, <coughs> okay. So uh, multi-height attention means that so we still want to learn the representation for one node, but we parallel this process by different parts, by different heights of, of attention, and then we concatenate them to learn the representation. So the reason why it is very stable is that so uh, the I the inputs of these two heights is actually the same, but the parameters are different. So the uh, optimal representation is different, and then we can continue them. So one, diff uh, one reason why it is very stable is that so suppose the original input is uh, slightly modified by users. Because we have two heads, multiple heads, then maybe one head is influenced, but other heads are not influenced. So if we can continue them, the optimal representation is still quite similar with the original one. Yeah. So but how do you know you will learn different things? put in all features, yeah. what prevents it from just converging to the same parameters? Uh, I think, so after convergence, if the inputs are quite different, then the representations might be very different. I mean, like, if you put in the same features, the same input, we have multiple hits, right? So why should the multiple hits be different? Uh, so the first reason is that actually the parameters of these different heights are different. So right. the parameters are different. Uh, yes, yes. So for the second reason is that so different prime uh, different height tries to extract different features from the original input. So one height tries to extract this feature to one subspace, subspace and the another height tries to extract it to another subspace, and then we can concatenate them. So different heights is responsible for different uh, features, different subspace, and then we can concatenate them. How do we know that will happen? So if I take one model with a single hit, I train it 10 times, 
I get 10 models, right? But if you expect this to be repeatable, you expect this to be 10 instances of the same model. I'm not quite sure with <laughs> this <laughs> internal mechanism of it. No, the, the, the other one is they say to stabilize learning. But, yeah, I mean, but usually when the learning is not stable, if you put in more parameters, you will make the problem even harder if uh, the learning is not stable. Because the objective will be definitely more complicated. So I can't understand why this particular uh, strategy will stabilize learning actually. Maybe it's just that the author they didn't express it in the right way. Well, I can understand that it may boost performance. Or maybe this statement doesn't come from this paper because the movie had attention is from the other paper. Oh yeah, yeah, so it's for, from yeah, yeah. The other that's another, <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's another point actually. I don't think it's a contribution of this paper. <laughs> yeah. That's true, yeah. They, they, I think they were referring to another paper. consider a small piece. <laughs> you can do it that way or you can make it more smaller and you change that more Yeah. So it's you can split it. Yeah. 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 So this one way Because maybe it's just the fact that when you do like the uh, scalar protect but then when you change a model it is a big model, right? So it's a bigger layer. So here in this way you have example in this way. So you have a final layer, the average, right? That's why you say the final layer is different. Yes. <laughs> so take an average. So uh, that's like being an ensemble learning. Uh, yeah. I guess so because the ultimate represent uh, ultimate the dimension of the representation is equal to sixty four for example. Right. So maybe for the final layer we need to uh, so the reason why we take average so previously we take the concatenation because each hat is responsible for thirty two. But the ultimate representation is still 64, so maybe this is the reason why we need to take the average one of concatenation. <coughs> if concatenation, maybe the number of dimensions increases. But you can still uh, put another operation to project it to the right dimension. Uh, yes, maybe that's true, but uh, maybe this paper uses this kind of transformation. Maybe that is also a useful one. Okay, so for the... Oh, I, I answered the question for first. <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> for question four, so uh, the, uh, I, you, you mean the hyperparameter of this data set is quite different from other two? Uh? Yeah, they say like they needed to change a little bit the architecture, they uh, needed to change the learning rate, and things like that. So I guess that depends on the nature of the data set. So other two data set is uh, Cora and Cecilia. Yeah. These two are uh, academic paper citation network, uh -huh. and the academic papers are in computer science category. Some some are machine learning, some are software engineering, and so on. So for this one, this is also a citation network, but the paper is actually the medical paper. So maybe that, maybe this is the one reason why uh, the hyperparameter is a little different from other two data sets. But I think the hyperparameter that we choose depends on the specific data set. This is a natural thing, I think. But yeah, so the question, how does this affect uh, the model edge? Uh, you mean different data set has I mean the fact that this data set is different, has some specific uh, uh, characteristic as compared to the other one. So how does this affect the model? 
maybe so if the number of data points in the data set is very big, uh -huh. then we of course need to change the learning rate because the loss function is quite big. So we need to learn very fast and then try to get the convergence point. So but then why do we need to, to change the architecture? We don't change the architecture. They, they, do. Huh? they do. They do they do a small change. Uh, which part do you mean the activation function or yeah they, they do change things in the get ar architecture they don't use the same model for all the data sets oh no you, you mean the number of levels huh? uh, <coughs> there is you can check the paper later but they say they do some uh, not only the learning rate they also change the, the architecture a little bit uh, I'm not sure but in terms of the activation function if it is changed it is reasonable I, I think activation function, but the whole architecture, I don't remember it changed. They, they changed a little bit, yeah. The size, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the size. <laughs> well, we can discuss this a little bit. Yeah, sure. Okay. So the is the, the proposed one, right? The, the yeah. proposed model. It's the model. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. So for uh, question three, actually the experimental excitings are identical to the previous paper. And actually, in order to keep a fair comparison between the GAT and GCN, the user of uh, the user of GAT paper also uh, also runs the GCN model again, use the similar hyperparameter, and then get the result. And we can turn back to the result. Yes, you know this video is public. <laughs> <laughs> so this GCN is the baseline model that yeah. you present previously. Yeah. So these three results are from your paper. Yeah. The author didn't run the experiment. Yeah. So actually this one is the same as this one. GCN is the same as this one. All mm -hmm. the details are the same. And the 64 means the dimension of representation is equal, equal to 64. Mm -hmm. Actually, previously for GAT model, it is also equal to 64. Mm -hmm. And in order to keep a fair comparison, the author also runs GCN again and get the result. Mm -hmm. And then this is the comparison between the proposed model and the baseline model. And we can see actually between this one and this one, the difference is not very big. The difference is not very big. So. This is the reason why, uh, why this is a, com a fair comparison because the author uh, uses the identical uh, experimental settings from the previous paper. But the hyperparameters in the paper were optimized for the GAT model. Mm -hmm. Okay. See, they use like this pilot uh, experiment to choose the good parameters for their models. So it's hard to say that those are the good parameters for GCN as well. So for uh, for GCN paper, the experiment also uses these three data set. So we we can say the hyperparameters have already been changed to the best one by default, and then we reuse reuse them. Uh, 64 <coughs> means the uh, number of dimensions is equal to 64. So the original one is equal? Uh, the original one is equal, it's still 64. So what's the <laughs> <laughs> uh, Because in, in order to keep a fair comparison, the author runs the GCN again. No, no, I mean, what are the difference between the original one and the GCN 64? This oh, is from the paper. This, this one is from, from the paper. The results are from the paper. Okay. They only run two. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, so I just want to more question. So what are different between the ZCN and the GAT? The main difference and the similarity and the difference. Uh, I think there are two differences. The first one is the multi height attention. Uh, in terms of GC, uh, the first one is the attention mechanism because GCN doesn't consider the different importances of different neighbors. So this is one uh, difference. This is also the reason why this model is called graph attention network. And the second difference is the multi height attention mechanism. It tries to extract different features from the same input to different subspaces and then concatenate them. Chief, 
for the first fire uh, probably actually because the way that when they multiply with the agency measure <coughs> already differentiate we distinguish in the contribution from the neighbor already. I binary make this one. No, 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 it's not binary. It's a normal line, it's a normal line metric, it's a real value. Because oh, it's in yeah, yeah. you can see No, but it's but, but for the for the all the nodes that are going to the same. So B and E are they the same for A? No, actually in the CCN they multiply with the I. The I already capture the different I mean the correlation. No, they just normalize. You know what, but they yeah. reflect the how a two not are correct. In their case, it's fixed. And it's not optimized for classification. Yeah, so, for so that's why they need you yeah. the attention, right? Yeah, yeah. but this and one is there that. and optimized for your task. You see what I mean? Like the normalization in GCN is obtained beforehand as a pre-processing step. And okay. then it's fixed. Okay. Whereas here, the attention, you learn the ways to do well for Another classification. Way. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so in terms of in terms of this paper, because we need to in terms of each layer, we need to propagate the representation to this node, right? So different different node contributes differently to the ultimate node. So this is why attention mechanism can work. Do, do they mention any about the running time for this kind? Because actually it depends on the the network, right? So let's say if one node have a many uh, neighbors. Take time, right? You can. I mean, in the first layer, you already have thousands of nodes, let's say. So in the second layer, you have another thousand. So you have. Uh, the author didn't record the running time of this model, but so in terms of this model, it has some analysis. Uh, the first analysis is, is actually the computation can be parallelized, because if we want to learn the representation for A, at the same time we can also learn the representation for B, as long as there isn't any overlapping part between A and B. So the computation can be parallelized. But actually, the, uh, the author didn't report the running time. Uh, I'm not sure. So maybe, uh, maybe you, are, you are right, but I don't think the, but actually, this is one advantage of this paper. The, 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 the problem is, you mean, they copy for all the nodes, yeah. or just few nodes? Yeah, maybe the, uh, the, ultimate in, the ultimate performance can be influenced, but I, as long as the paper re, uh, the also reports this advantage, I don't think the influence, uh, the performance will be influenced much. Yes, yeah, because I think have uh, some uh, redundant computation, like, Let's say the not E, let's say for A, in the case you compute the represent for A, right? You have E and the neighbor, right? Mm. And if let's say next you compute the representation for not F, you also have E. So mean that you really do the same computation. Oh, the, the sequence of layers cannot be changed. The layers should be computed layer by layer. But actually different layers, uh, different nodes can be parallelized. Yeah, but I, I mean, I'm thinking about, let's say now, you, you, your target node is A. Mm -hmm. You will consider E in the, in the first layer, right? Mm -hmm. But now, if the your target node is the F, E also in the first layer. Oh, uh, yes. Not the problem. You, use, you always use the previous representation of E for both F and A. Once this is done, you can compute for F a new uh, representation. It means yeah. you will not have like a two representation of F at different at the same step. No, Why is that? No, I, I was thinking about let's say now because now you compute for different target node, right? Yes. So this yes. parallel uh, yeah. computation, yes. right? So mean that let's say if the target A, target F, you also consider E. Yes. So but the computation about the attention away or about the representation or about the learning the immediate representation. Yeah, but you do it for F and A. And the attention is something that goes to uh, uh, F, F, D, and F, E, and then A, V, and A, E. Why is that the problem? The problem is that you I mean, compute the same thing. No, again, you, again. you are not computing the same thing. The pairs are different. The pair different, but yeah. you the, let's say the part when you learn the immediate representation. Right? But you are learning the representation of A and F, and E stays fixed for now. And A and F are independent. Yes. So, so you see, 
is no. Then how about the another node connect to E? Now let's say for the case of B. Yeah, that one. That one is an issue. Yeah. yeah but he says like you can parallelize yeah, yeah, it for when there is no direct connection between. Uh, yeah. Nodes. Yeah. So this have a two uh, two yeah. nodes. I think the case of B is. Yeah. I mean, I I, yeah. I I mean this case. Uh, uh, this one not clear to me. So you say you can parallelize based on the number of connected components in the graph, right? I think not exactly. I think it's not exactly uh, <laughs> independent <laughs> components in the graph. <laughs> I think he said you can parallelize the computation for each node as long as they don't have direct connections in the graph. I don't know the graph, right? But in terms of the feature space, uh, do you think they still can somehow affect each other? Uh, and directly, yeah. Uh, if they share common neighbors, yeah, they would be definitely influenced. Yeah, so this is the reason why I say the computation can be parallelized as long as there isn't any overlapping part between two different nodes. So I just use A and D as an example. So you cannot tell whether they are not related. O overlapping, he, w he says like direct neighbors, like first order neighbors, but there may be indirect uh, overlap. Yeah, so in terms of graph structure, it's hard they to are say, not yeah. connected. It's hard to say. But maybe yeah. the feature of the two nodes, they are related. They, they may be dependent, yeah, exactly. So if you parallelize plenty of views, basically you skip the relatedness among the features. Oh, not really. Because what will happen is that you just update the representation simultaneously. It's like when you do, uh, for example, HDD for uh, matrix factorization, you have U and V. You can update them in sequence or you can update them simultaneously. But over time, because when you update E, you use the previous uh, representation of U, is somehow you can capture uh, the relatedness between the factors. So we, I, I, in terms of learning, it doesn't change a lot. Yes. I think it depends on the way that you you make the the yeah, now the, difficult, uh, the difficulty is to uh, design the, uh, uh, the scheme to parallelize computations because it takes effort to each node to... Uh, actually, it's not that easy to say I cluster my nodes and I start to do parallel computations. Yeah.